Hello again. We are continuing today our introduction series to some of our panelists. Today we're talking to Wade Watts in Canada. Hi, Wade. How are you going? I'm doing great, Rodney. How are you today? I'm doing all right, but don't call me Rodney because that's what Mum called me when I was in trouble. It's got to be Rod, mate. Okay, okay, Rod. That's be- <laughs> That's better. All right. As long as I don't call you late for di- dinner, we should be good. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Listen, um, we started off with Anya about asking her about how she got into the situation that she was in. Are we okay to ask yep. you that as well? Oh, for sure. Yes, you can ask me anything. Well, I'll let you tell us all about it, and then we'll talk about more exciting things after that. Well, uh, prior to 2015, which was the year my accident happened, um, I was a engineer, civil solar engineer, project manager, and I was working on solar installation farms from anywhere from 100 acres in size to 300 acres in size. And I worked... Uh, all over the world. Sorry, my wife just corrected me. It was in 2014, not 2015. So that's how much I uh, listened to the story myself. But anyways, um, I had uh, I was working in Cebu, Philippines, um, doing a solar engineering project, a test site with uh, a company there called Medano Energy. And at the hotel, um, after a very long, hot day, I jumped in the pool. Um, that was an open pool. And um, once I got out of the pool, I went to uh, walk down, believe it or not, six stairs just to uh, get to the bottom where my wife was in the lounge area. And I slipped on the top step and I went down. I hit the back of my neck right about here uh, in the corner of one of the steps and went down and landed up against a concrete wall. And uh, at that point, I felt some weird pains and sensations in my legs and stuff, but I managed to uh, walk back to my hotel room. But uh, when I got to the room very shortly after, I couldn't move my right leg. Uh, My whole right side started feeling numb. I wasn't sure what was going on. I thought maybe I was having a stroke. Um, But... um, in the hospital, they uh, did in the Philippines. They X-rayed me, did everything, and they found nothing wrong with my spine. Um, so I, with my insurance, I was um, what they call mercy flown uh, back to Canada. Um, I had to do a stop in Hong Kong first, so they could ensure that I was stable enough for the ride back home to Canada. And when I got to Canada after three months in the hospital, they and uh, some advice from a neurosurgeon who actually is in the Philippines. They stopped checking my spine and nerves and they started checking my head. And that's when it was discovered that I had been misdiagnosed for I think at least 17 years, if not longer, and that I have a disease called prime progressive multiple sclerosis. And that that had weakened my spine. Um, I have 27 lesions on my brain, 17 in my spinal cord. And I have a spinal cord pull where a little bit of my spine was actually pulled out of my brain um, from the fall. And so now I am in a wheelchair and um, that's uh, that's pretty much the story without getting into much longer details. You know, it's amazing because we learn things every day. I had no idea really what had happened to you because I've never asked you because it's kind of irrelevant because we're just mates and we do things together, (laughs) you know. But the only reason I'm asking is the interest of perhaps the viewers. And I assume that it was a spinal cord injury from the beginning. Yeah, no, I don't uh, talk about it unless I'm asked, obviously, because I'm just getting on with my life and doing what's necessary. But uh, it doesn't matter if somebody does ask me as long as it's done in good taste and out of respect. I have no, in fact, I feel that it's an education and that maybe my duty um, now is to educate people on you know, stuff like this. So I'm trying to fix my glasses because they're even, crooked. That's all right. Even if you hadn't fallen down the steps, this would have probably happened eventually anyway. Is that the situation? Uh, yes. At the time of my fall, I was walking with a cane. 
Um, I had had many problems before that, you know, falls, loss of balance, uh, things that didn't make sense to me. But uh, as you know, I'm an ex-soldier, Canadian Airborne, and I uh, um, had gotten some shrapnel in my lower legs when I was in Somalia. So every time I complained about something going wrong or not, you know, being able to keep my balance or having pain, um, the doctors always put it to my injuries I sustained when I was in Somalia. But, um, um, and so the, every time I went and talked about it and talked about the pain, they just upped my dosage of very powerful painkillers to a point um, where I was an outright absolute addict. Um, I was addicted to some very powerful drugs. Um, and after I was finally diagnosed after my fall and after three months, they finally found out what was actually wrong with me with my disease. Um, I was told very quickly by my neurosurgeon and some other specialists that there is no pain medication for nerve pain. And that by and me taking that, this medication, way, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and by taking all this medication, all I'm doing is killing myself. Like, I was literally taking enough medication to knock out an elephant. And, yeah. and I, it would have killed me. I might not even be here right now if I hadn't uh, tossed all that medication down the toilet. And now I only take vitamins. I eat properly. I work out. And I've actually went back where they told me it was not possible. But, I'm not sure you know, about that here we are. eating properly thing. I think we had a pretty big burger while you were here in Thailand. <laughs> okay, well, you know, there's always, always, always those cases where it's just not going to say no to when there's some good food offered. In fact, every time I go to uh, Asia, and like in Thailand, the food is so amazing, I always have to come back in Canada, and first thing I do is go on a diet. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to have to do that one day. I went on a diet one other time, and it was the worst 30 minutes of my life, I promise. Yeah, no, I, I hear you, brother. And, well, you know, I've got a wife who's just an absolute amazing cook. So uh, it's a lose-lose situation for me. That's kind of funny. Now, you know what? With all due respect, I'm glad I asked these questions for our viewers because I've learned an awful lot about you today. And I find it extremely interesting. Um, so I hope well, they do as well. Thank you. Now, in moving on from that, you now work. Well, I, I can see the T-shirt. It says Wheelchair Friendly Solutions Incorporate. Incorporated? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about Incorporated, that? Incorporated, yes. Yep. Well, um, after I had my accident and I was diagnosed, um, you know, like I probably imagine most people who become dis um, you know, there was the time I was depressed. Um, you know, I couldn't accept it. I didn't accept the, the wheelchair. I, I continued to try and walk with, you know, stiff braces and walkers. And, you know, walk like, a, like you said earlier with Anya, like a drunk penguin. And I never got anywhere because it took me, you know, it take me an hour to go 10 feet. But I didn't want to accept the wheelchair. Um, you know, but the, uh, I did accept the wheelchair um, and I started to get out and I realized very quickly that the wheelchair wasn't a disability and it wasn't something to be frowned upon. The wheelchair was the most amazing mobility device. I mean, I got to go places. I mean, I met people who spent a long time in wheelchairs. I learned how to do wheelies. I mean, the very gentleman I met who really encouraged me to use my wheelchair more, his name's Larry Van Norman and I still consider him... Uh, somebody I hold very close to me, because one of the very first things he said to me was, if you don't fall out of your wheelchair once a month, you're not trying hard enough. And he knew me being ex-military, that that was something that would motivate me. And uh, he helped me and taught me. And he actually took me to a, a skate park, if you can believe that. He took me to a skate park for skateboards and he started throwing me in a wheelchair, telling me to go down these lips and do things and then jumping curbs and, and how to go not only down a set of stairs that has a solid handrail, but you know, if it's only five or six stairs, how to actually pull myself up these stairs in my wheelchair. So it was very quickly. I learned that my arms are now my legs and, um, you know, I concentrated on that because I wanted more mobility. 
And so that's how I ended up, you know, um, uh, using a wheelchair um, and actually understanding that that's my life. And, you know, if I want to travel, I want to. Uh, Sounds like he was you know, a great a, he, mentor to have. He, oh, he, he, he still is. He still is a great and it's mentor, that amazing and feeling when you get started, when you pass that point of balance, and you know you're going to end up on your back looking at the stars, but you don't really care anymore because it's all part of the fun. Yeah, well, like everybody in a wheelchair, I imagine knows, eh? When you go past that balance part, the first thing you do is put your chin to your chest, like so, so you don't crack the back of your head and you let the wheelchair take the hit. So, You've done that I once mean, before, just simple so you thing. probably didn't want to do it again. <laughs> yeah, well, the very first time I did in a gravel driveway, so I decided I'm not going to uh, uh, have any more uh, blood streaming down the back of my neck. So I learned how to very quickly, you know, you, as soon as you know that you're, or if you're going to jump something and you're not sure, you do it, and you always keep your head in a position that if you go over, the handles on the back of the wheelchair will take the hit. Mate, tell us a little bit more about what you do with Wheelchair Friendly Solutions, why well, you started that's kind it, of, and, and, and why you, what you want to do with it. Well, that's how it all started was I learned how to use the wheelchair, but once I got in the wheelchair, I now understood that um, the, my only disability was accessibility. I could no longer go to my favorite restaurant. I could no longer... You know, go out with my wife, going to a movie theater became, and see a movie became, uh, you know, something we just couldn't do. And then my favorite thing is water. I mean, I probably, sh you know, should be, will be reincarnated as a fish because I love the water so much, but I could no longer go swimming. I couldn't go to the beach with my friends. Um, you know, just simply going out, even though I have hand control, just simply going out and, you know, using a jet ski or, or doing anything, it became that. So I started this company on the basis that there were cost-effective, really good solutions, but nobody knew about them, and they weren't well, being used for people with disability. Because you've invented well, some of them, and they are mostly yeah. based around water, I notice. Um, a vast majority are based around well, water, parks, camping, outdoor activities, being able to enjoy the outdoors. Um, the biggest problem I seen w was beaches, not just in Canada, but worldwide. So that has now growing to so, be sorry, my number one before, business. Before you go any further, yep. what you're really doing in some ways is bringing what you had before back into your life and allowing other people to benefit by it. Would you say that's fairly accurate? Uh, yes, that is very accurate. Uh, my main motivator, though, was um, we have an organization in Canada. It's called Easter Seals. And it's a, an organization that strictly deals with children um, with physical disabilities by providing summer camp. Uh, they actually own across Canada quite a few summer camps. In Ontario, my province, they, there's two of them. Um, and after a visit up to the camp and realizing that I was told by the camp counselors and the people attending the camp that the majority of the people, especially the electric wheelchair users, were observers. They couldn't go canoeing. They couldn't go out in the boats. They couldn't go swimming. There were so many things they couldn't do that all the other children who didn't have such severe disabilities were able to do. And Nothing that really bothers than, me knowing... Um... Nothing. Sorry, I have to interrupt occasionally to get a point yeah, across. No, that's fine. When you, when yeah. you wade, I might not speak for a half an hour if I don't interrupt. <laughs> um, so nothing sucks more than just watching, does it? No, yeah, an observer is the worst. It's, a, it's, it's absolute stripping of your dignity, your independence, your equality, and... It's a, such a bad feeling, and I know from talking with many people with disability, even like yourself. So if you you just stop going out because, because you're forced you, to watch somebody yes. else doing exactly what you want to do, and you can't. So it's like rubbing it in a bit. And the only reason you can't is because you can't get there. That's right. It's the you know if there's sand, you're in the parking lot, the asphalt parking lot, watching you know whatever you know down at the beach having a good time and every once in a while they'll walk up to see if you're okay if you need anything 
Yeah, would you like a Coca Cola right? while we're all having a good time in the water? And, and look, exactly. I've been there many times where you don't want to ruin other people's lives. You don't want to stop them from doing things. So what you end up saying, even and you mean it, but you don't really want to say it is, no, no, you go ahead, you know, go ahead and enjoy. It's okay with me, and it is okay, but it's sort of a self-inflicted agony, really, isn't it? Yes, it's, uh, as I say, it's one of those things that you have to bury down deep, deep, deep inside you. Because if you don't, um, it, well, you'll end up not doing anything. You'll end up staying in your, you know, your home or you know wherever you live and not going out, and and that's even worse. Um, and you know, as far as any disability, I mean, getting out, enjoying, especially water. Like, let's face it, I've talked to any, every single person I talk to with a disability. The common denominator seems to be water, whether it's a lake, ocean, or a swimming pool. Um, I mean, I can actually stand up in water, or which I can't do on ground, right? Or out on a boat. I mean, it's a common denominator. And everywhere you travel around the world and you talk to people, I mean, you know, it's people with disabilities aren't able to enjoy the outdoors like everybody else. And they stop doing things. And, not, and it ends up not just being the person with disability. Their friends and family sometimes stop doing these things. Yes, because, because if when you they were negative, out, you can't afford to be negative or you're ruining their lives. Yeah. And then they don't want to do things because they know you can't do them. So everybody's trying to be nice and it, and it sort of, suffocates everybody really and i know that for me one of my dreams was to go on a houseboat and one day i found an accessible houseboat and it it brought me to tears to be honest to be on the houseboat and just enjoying life and that's how palatable it feels when you can finally get back to doing things or do things for the first time yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it's changed my life. It's changed my outlook on life. Um, being able to offer um, not only uh, good accessible solutions to solve these problems, but to do it in a cost effective way and to be able to offer these products and to let people know that, uh, you know, it's not as hard as you might think. It's not as expensive as you might think. And all it does is it takes a little bit of research, a little bit of education and, you know, and it's not about wheelchairs. It's really not. It never has been, and it never wheelchair. It uh, never will be. Sorry. Um, what accessibility is about is a better, safer life for everybody, regardless of their ability. I mean, let any parent will tell you that uh, having a child in a baby stroller and having you know a couple parcels and trying to open a door and get up a couple steps. I mean, I actually believe parents with children have you know more accessibility problems than I do. Um, it's about people, you know, nobody's getting younger. We're all getting older. So, you know, uh, doors that are hard to open and steps, um, you know, for people with canes, walkers, whatever, it's all, and there's no reason for it, um, you know, with uh, today and, you know, the way and what we know to still be building with curbs and to be building the way we build and have been building since the, basically the 1920s and 30s we'll is ridiculous pretty much in in the show when we talk yeah. about accessibility. Yeah. The two things that I know that you've built is beach matting. We won't go into them in, in detail. And also uh, your beach chair. Can you tell us Loading. a little bit about the beach yeah. chair? Well, um, the beach chair, um, I can't take credit for the entire invention. I My only credit is actually... Um, bringing it, uh, modernizing it, bringing it for better safety standards and making it, you know, with chest straps and chest belts and making it so basically any disability that um, I have investigated and I through our beta testing, um, it can be used and it can be used comfortably and safe. And it's an amphibious wheelchair is what it is. And it can be taken apart with no tools, folded up and put in the trunk or in the back of a van or whatever. And right at the parking lot, you can put it together. Um, a person with disability or, you know, somebody with um, other challenges or an elderly person or whatever. They can, you know, they can get in this, be rolled across the mud, the gravel, the tree roots, whatever, across the sand and go right into the water. 
and uh, to, and to plagiarize for that, the Muhammad rips. Ali, it floats like a butterfly and swims in the sea. That's right, buddy. That's actually a good statement. I, I might just have made to that up. Take My that head's from full you. of rubbish. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually, that sounded pretty good. I wonder if, uh, yeah. I wonder if he'd let have to use that. that story, yeah, buddy. that'd be good. <laughs> yeah, you got my head thinking now. Uh, Kyle's but yeah, that's, that's what it's all about. Yeah, Look, that's, um, that's what it's all about. It's, what I think we'll do, we'll, we'll edit parts of this, but we'll also put the whole yeah. interview on so people can watch the short one or the long one. But a, a few more yeah. questions that I've got for you. What is important to you now? It seems like not just accessibility, but travel and making the most out of life. What do you want to do? What What do you want to achieve in your life? Well, what I want to achieve uh, is I would like to achieve, you know, we are an inclusive company. Um, I um, Every person that works for me, except for one uh, worldwide, are persons with disabilities. So I, so what I want to achieve in life is I would like to do what I can to help the world become more accessible for everybody. Um, and I'd like to set my company up so I can spend uh, my time traveling, um, seeing what's accessible, what's not, maybe educating people on, you know, simple, cost-effective, easy, and not only easy, but profitable accessibility solutions because, by not being accessible, you're turning away 1.39 billion people in this world who can't come to your place. And I mean, if you include friends and families to that number, I mean, I can't even imagine what the number is. It's an outrageous and figure, so isn't it's it? Get, it's an outrageous figure. So let, we need to get this information. We need to educate. Education is the most, everything that I've done means nothing. So where do you see the educate. spin so, coming into this? The spin is an education, is a show that I think is going to be amazing. Uh, you've got awesome panelists. You've chosen everybody from every facet of life. And so it's going to be an education. And it's going to not just teach people with disabilities that, you know, there's life beyond the wheelchair. There's life beyond the disability. It's actually going to show, you know, people who have no disability and don't understand and are, you know, what I call standoffish or... The other words, or you know, disrespectful or frightened. Yeah, sometimes, yes. I still don't get that one. But anyways, the frightened part. But, you know, through education, we can and just, you know, and just out of not being afraid to tell your story. I mean, it's like, you know, we, we've said this many times together. As long as it's done respectfully. Well, it's, it's one no of the problem. reasons that and, we're asking our panelists to share their story is in some cases, quite a lot of cases, there's a hesitancy even with people with disabilities and mobility impairment to, to ask or share their stories. And actually, I think there's a great deal of power in sharing our stories with each other voluntarily. Yeah, no, it's... Uh... It's an education. I can't tell you how many times, and it really bothers me when a child or something will come up and approach me or ask me a question, and a mother will grab the child by the arm or something, pull them away and say, you know, and you can tell it's not the child. The child is very comfortable. It's the, the mother who's curious. uncomfortable. Yeah, the child's just curious. So I always go out of my way to try not just to educate the child, but more so to educate, to educate the mother. The well, you know. Right? And to do it. And again, I do that in a in a very kind, respectful way, so they understand that you know I'm only trying to give them information and ease their fears of people with disability, and to show them that there's nothing to afraid of. We're just people. Um, one of my favorite sayings when I talk to people is, "All my wheelchair is is a very expensive pair of running shoes." I knew that was coming, and I love it. So now we've yeah. got Muhammad Ali and Nike on board. And Nike on all, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, we, we just be do careful. it, don't we? We just do it. Yeah, we just do it. Yeah, That's I tell tell people, um, you know, um, accessibility, being in a wheelchair, being whatever. If if anybody truly thinks that I am disabled, and I can't get them, so I just say, well, let's go for a cup of coffee, and who's ever last getting there has to pay. <laughs> so, well, actually, here in Thailand. 
because I use my wheelchair to get around <coughs> with a with a front wheel drive on it. I usually beat the people in the cars to wherever we're going. Let me tell you. But yep. to get Especially back to in a traffic point we made in Bangkok, before, I can imagine about education and sharing our stories. The best way I can illustrate it is today. This very interview, I've learned so much about you that I didn't know before, and I, I didn't ask you not because I was frightened, but because convention has probably got inside of me to the point that I hesitate to ask people, uh, I guess. And really, you and I have learned stuff from each other in the very short time we've known each other. Yeah. No, uh, we have. We truly have. And uh, as you know, me being in Thailand last year for the Friendly Design Expo uh, was a huge education for me. I, I'm not going to lie and tell you that when uh, I received the specification to come to Thailand, it, it happened when I was in Tokyo, Japan at the HCR show. We have to and give uh, Udi a bit of yeah, give, that. give Udi a call out for that. Yep, that was awesome. Yes, I owe Udi for, uh, you know, introducing me this and easing me uh, my concerns a little bit. But I was still concerned because I was doing a tour, an Asian tour, and I was in Hong Kong just before I came to Thailand. And I didn't know what to expect. Like literally from, I knew I was in an accessible airline because it's the airline I use all the time, but I didn't know what to expect when I got to the airport. And I mean, it started the second they opened the door of that airplane. I couldn't believe it. They had my wheelchair sitting there waiting for me, not some airport chair. They had an attendant there who was more than, you know, was there for me right Just from the time I got off the plane. That doesn't always right. happen, but it often happens. Yes, go ahead. Well, it happened with me and I didn't require it. I didn't need it because I've traveled with my wife. Yep. And uh, she hooks all my the luggage on the back of my chair like a luggage and makes me be the pack mule anyway, so I get in shape. But, you know, we got out there and then when we needed to get a vehicle to get to the impact center and to our hotel, I mean, I asked them, they seen that I was in a wheelchair, so they only presented me with options that would be accessible. And I don't think they increased the cost any um, because I was uh, had a disability, which we both know that happens in a lot of places. Um, so, and then, you know, everything just cycled on through. And then I met you, I met everybody at the Friendly Design Expo. And I, uh, and then you took me on a tour after the expo. Well, that's funny because but me and my I wife still talk about tour, every day. You still had that ingrown was, uh, disbelief or hesitancy because we left the, and I, and I respect that because I have it also, but when I said to you I was going to take you to a, a place, Nong Nooch Garden, that was incredibly accessible and everything, you said to me, many people have told you things like that, and usually they aren't. But it was, wasn't it? Yes. No, um, that was actually what, one of the big educations for me, and it came from you. So thank you for taking the time to you know take me out there and show me I mean, the resort you had me at, the Tamara Resort, um, the owner is just, I mean, he's just incredible for what he's done there. Um, the resort was beautiful and it was more accessible. I mean, I got to be honest with you, I, I've i never been to the hotel in Bangkok and the resort, I got to say, are probably the two most accessible places I have been to in Asia, period. Yep. So that was a huge education for me. I still am, and as you know, I can't stop talking about Thailand. It's, it's just amazing. And then to, uh, you know, understand and now to help with the spin and with your company anywhere you know, on wheels, and to move forward with this to educate people that you know you don't have to be afraid to get on an airplane and go to somewhere like Thailand. That not only is it going to be an experience of a lifetime and memories that you'll never forget. And the fact is, is once you're there, let, I gotta be honest, you just don't wanna leave. We'll so, I mean, that being said, yeah. So, I mean, I'm definitely coming back. In fact, I'm coming back this year for the 2019 Friendly Design Expo, um, and I wouldn't miss it for the world. And Thailand is definitely um, the, uh, the up there one and two. I gotta I tell you on, on my list of most well, accessible right? countries. Uh, yes, I have. I'm uh, making plans to ensure, yes, to make sure. 
and I am actually trying to get a group of friends, uh, some from Canada, uh, one from the United States, and one, believe it or not, from Sri Lanka, who all wants to come and meet us for the Friendly Design Expo, and then afterwards, um, we'll do the tour. You know, we're hoping to take a 15, 14 days and minimum. That's what I told them because I'm 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 staying for fourteen days minimum this time, if not longer. Okay, and between you and I working together with Wheelchair Friendly Solutions Incorporated and Accessible Globe Anywhere on Wheels, you and I have some plans yeah. to make a lot more places accessible for all of us, including ourselves. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. And as you know, I my wife is Filipino, and I have a little bit of property in the southern Philippines and whatever. And I, people tell that to me all the time. How can you go to the Philippines when you're in a wheelchair? And when I say to people, well, the Philippines is actually more accessible than Canada. I, well, first of all, I get in a lot of trouble for saying that because people in Canada don't like that. But the fact is, is and it's not because they build specifically for people with disability. They just understand that accessible construction is cheaper construction, so they just do it. It's just a better way to build. It's easier. So they just do it that way, and it ends up, for me, being wonderful because I can zoom around and, and get places and do things and, I mean, and have the freedom because of not all the restrictions like they have in North America, the freedom well, to do that's things. That's a big part like, of you know, it. Go, There's go, no yeah. workplace health safety or anything like that and because no. the people um because the people are used to pop me back on for a sec carl if you can because the people are used to having to make do themselves because they've grown up in a country that hasn't been easy for anyone they have attitudes that are more of let's find our way around the obstacle rather than complain about it. Would you agree with that? Yes, that, that's a very good way to put it. Um, you know, I, I get all the time, and you, you know this about Thailand, and this about Philippines too, because I know you're a man. Um, it's, a lot of it is it's about the people. It's about how the people's attitudes are, how they think. They don't, when I'm in the Philippines or in Thailand, I don't ever, I can't remember once somebody looking down on me or treating me differently because I was in a wheelchair or I had a disability. And in fact, it's the exact opposite where if I sit, you know, maybe, you know, I sit somewhere for a minute or two and I might just be sitting there because my wife is in a store or something and I just don't want to be there. I just want to relax in the sun. But you can't sit there, you're, you know, you you know, people are automatically right away coming up to you. Uh, is there anything we can help you with, sir? You know, is there, do you, do you need help getting in or doing stuff like that? And, and, and store and owners and small businesses. on you, really. No, they don't. They don't force themselves on you. They, you know, I mean, one of my favorite stories I like to tell about my time when I was in Thailand was, you know, I, for whatever reason, maybe because of all the Canadian flags, I was, a uh, bit of a, I don't know what you call it, but uh, some people like yourself kind of made me a bit of a star, I guess, when I was there. And I met all you these really important, very important top government officials, like from deputy prime ministers down, including the minister of tourism. And to hear that the minister of tourism spent an entire day days in a wheelchair and actually yeah. days, uh, yeah, plus, and went to, you know, government funded tourism and private destinations with a wheelchair. He so he me personally into the wheelchair bathroom. Yeah. I mean, I sorry but I, that's awesome. I mean, that that just shows you the difference in attitude where you know these people are doing it. And then I met uh, I forget what his name was, but I met another person who was there's a picture of me and you with him. I think he's like one of the prime minister's sons or something. Yeah. Well, and, I remember you know, him. Yep. Yeah. Amazing and guy. just to have the talk that I had, yeah, amazing guy, but just to have the talk about him and I, and I asked him, you know, but, and, you know, he outright said, you know, Thailand, you know, and what you guys, and what's happening with the friendly design people and Pin Krishna, I mean, what they're doing over there is nothing like anything else I've seen, not only in Asia, but in North America. Either. Uh, in the world. Uh, 
I think that in the world, period. I think that one of the things I've been wanting to say, and it's perfect time to say it, is Kun Krishna is a perfect example, along with Kun Yut, of what one or two people can do to change a country. Kun Krishna is uh, the head of the friendly design people, and we've got the ad going on the bottom there. Um, and he was a newscaster before he became uh, in a wheelchair or disabled, if you like. And between himself and Kun Yut and a few other people who are all in wheelchairs, they have changed the face of Thailand and made it accessible by embracing their life with mobility impairment and moving forward. And, the, and to be honest, I was just a couple of days ago with the owner of Nong Nooch Garden, that wonderful place we went together. Yes. And he Amazing very place. graciously gave me an interview. And I said to him, why? Why have you made this place so accessible, so wonderful? Because I said, you don't have to. It's, it's, it's obviously making a lot of money. You know, why have you done this? <laughs> and he looked. Yeah, because <coughs> you were there. You saw there were, there's like 20,000 yeah. people a oh. day go there. It's incredible. 6,000 yeah. staff and all sorts of things. 600 acres. Yeah, it's like absolutely an Absolutely amazing. Land. And he <laughs> said to me, he turned around and he looked straight at Kun Krishna. And he said, I think we owe this to Kun Krishna, who put pressure on us to do things we should have done a long time ago. Yes, and there you go. I mean, I, I'll admit it, Kun Krishna is one of my heroes in the world. I, I look up to that when person. I think about that. Yeah, yeah, and then, and then the fact that he came to Canada to visit me with and Kun to... With Kun Yut and uh, other members of the team from the, his friendly design organization. And I mean, you know, I, I'm just blown away, you know, in this, such a short period of time, I've become such close friends with yourself, Kun Yut, Kun Krishna, and being able to hear their stories. But one of my favorite things was um, um, we had a nice little talk when we were at the Friendly Design Expo, but when they were here in Toronto, um, we went out for a special dinner and I had a chance to talk to Kun Krishna about, uh, you know, about being in the wheelchair and what it's done. And we both had the same statement. We both agree that we have never been more able in our lives since we have been put in the wheelchair. And what we try to mean by that and say by that is by understanding the world as it really is and not what you see on TV, but understanding and opening your eyes. I mean, I was an engineer for 23 years. Do you think I ever once in that 23 years thought about accessibility or other people when I was doing projects and building? Maybe these? once when you no, opened the door for someone? Not even. I got to be honest with you. I was probably the worst person for this. Right, because I my my I, my focus was on time on budget. That's it, nothing else. Yeah. So and now I actually feel guilty when I look back on my career, and realize that I have accomplished more for the world that we live in since I've been in the wheelchair since 2014. Yep. Than I accomplished the whole rest of my life, and I'm 52 years old. Yep. So, I mean, this is the best time of my life. I don't begrudge the wheelchair i look over because when i say that my wheelchair is sitting over there and i uh and right I, next to you your know, friendly design ambassador uh frame in the background by the way we might run frame, that out yes. again carl yeah no um that's another thing you know to be over there and to be recognized for my efforts in thailand something you know that uh even in my own country has really not happened yet but in Thailand, you know, for seeing and being recognized and then being made an international friendly design ambassador by Kun Krishna himself uh, is amazing. And then, you know, not even, what are we talking, seven months later, he's on a plane coming to Canada. Yes. To fantastic. visit me, to see, to see what I have already told him about Canada and yep. specifically Southern Ontario. Because in Canada, the province of Ontario, we have some of the strictest accessibility laws in the entire world. Yep. But 
The reason it's not moving forward as it should be is because there's no enforcement. And we don't have a team like the friendly design team that goes around checking um, accessibility and checking things and working. It's a powerful tool. And And I I wish I could emulate the friendly design here in Canada. I I really hope that's something that we can accomplish in the future. I think that was our plan with Kun Krishna and Kun Yud. And I I cannot, I need to express that Kun Krishna is the face of friendly design. But as much as he's the face of it, Kun Yut has many companies that employ people in wheelchairs. You haven't yet seen his resort, which is completely yeah. accessible. And Kun Krishna and Kun Yut kind of work together because Kun Yut, uh, for example, we were trying to make a business decision and Kun Yut said, uh, Kun Krishna said to Kun Yut, what do you think I should do? So they work together very, very well. And, and as you yeah. said, a good... Uh, Shout out to Matt at Tamara for the people like that that are that are embracing the vision. Uh, Matt Brandon, yep, and, awesome and, guy. And making friendly design more than just a concept, but a reality here in Thailand and hopefully around the world. I think we've probably introduced you as much as we can. We're going to have to break this into a 13-part probably, series. Probably too much because I... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know what? I uh, have you to give you me. an award I, 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 today because you've only mentioned Canada five times in the whole program, whereas normally you do it five times a minute. So you are also a Canadian ambassador. I know that. You love your country and you love what it does. And we like what you do and who you are. And we are very proud and honoured to have you on the spin. And we hope that this is a relationship between us that goes for many, many years. Uh, well, it, as far as I'm concerned, we're here till death and then some. So we'll, uh, <laughs> well, we'll do the best. Told us, uh, you weren't there, but at the Christmas party, he said, I plan to run the friendly design for 100 years, and we've had three now. So there's 97 left to go. So do not get sick, do not die, and do not leave. So we've got a long way well, to go, mate. Whatever happens, buddy, I'm doing this till my last breath. So um, this is not a job to me. This is not, uh, it's not about making money. None of it. This just seems to be the right thing to do. And I finally am doing something in my life that gives me good feelings. And I wake up every morning knowing that uh, this day is a good day. The sun's up. I'm a part of it. And, you know, and, and the, the, what the other, the other is, no, not acceptable. The other is six feet under, right? So well, uh, you've become, every day is right. a special day. And know that you've become, I, I don't have a lot of friends, but you've become a, a friend very quickly and a good friend. And I look forward to uh, advancing our cause together and seeing yeah. you on the spin in the next couple of weeks, mate. That sounds awesome. Um, thanks for this time. And uh I love being part of Anywhere on Wheels. Um, you guys are doing amazing things. And, um, you too. I'm glad that you uh, like what I'm doing, and I'm glad to be your friend. So thank you very much.